<laughs> All right. So, shall we get started? This is our first content lesson. So, there's some things I need to go through so you guys know what to kind of expect and what I've just handed out to you guys. All right. So, booklet, which you guys were so impressed by. Thank you. Um, that is for you guys to keep. Um, I'm happy if you want to take it home or if you want to store it in our classroom. Remember, I do have a box in that shelf for you guys. Um, that booklet has all my PowerPoint notes on there, so you don't have to worry about madly scribbling things down. Um, uh, my thought process behind it is that it's really good to get you used to university. Um, I don't know if it's changed. It's been like 10 years since I've been at uni, but... Um, the way they did notes at university is they often would create, especially in the undergrad program, they would give you a booklet of all the notes from the lecturer, and then you would have the PowerPoint slides in front of you while you were sitting in your lectures, and you would jot down whatever the teacher was saying. So um, I want to get you guys used to that style. And then the other thing is I have a lot of notes, like science has a lot of content, so it's useful for me to kind of just give it to you to start with. Um, my little trick when I was at university, and I'll share it with you guys, it might be helpful to you, is that I like to color code a lot of stuff. Um, when I was in my lectures, I would only write in a blue pen. And then when I was at home making my own notes, I would only write in a black pen. So that way I could distinguish what came out of the lecturer's mouth and what was just me kind of processing. It also allows you guys to have a look ahead of time as well, if you want to kind of work ahead. Um, so that's that. Um, the second piece of paper I've handed to you is red, and that is the success criteria. So it's just a list of all the things we are going to cover. The front bit just has the list, uh, and the back bit has kind of it broken down in achieve merit and excellence. So you can see how um, the material we cover gets assessed at different levels. Does that make sense so far? I'm sorry that it's in the red color and it's a little bit hard to read. I just needed to use a color and it was one that I grabbed. Um, so do keep that in mind it's there. Um, what you'll notice is that there's a couple of columns there, and that's for us to kind of tick off. So I'll mention when to tick off when. Uh, it's also then used if you guys, or sorry, when you guys are revising uh, as a means to kind of check to make sure you know everything. Cool? Are we good so far? Do you want me to turn the lights? Yeah. The majority say no. All right. The last thing I've handed out to you guys is a blue piece of card, and that is your periodic table slash resource sheet that you will get on the externals. Uh, I put it on card so that way it's nice and durable because you're going to use it throughout the year for different uh, topics because it's got the periodic table on there and the equations. Um, and I think that's the main three things that I need to talk about paper-wise. So um, my kind of routines and expectations is that you are obviously taking notes. I expect the date to be written down, and I expect the learning intention to be written down somewhere in your notes. So you can either do it on paper, um, or you can do things online. I'm happy with whichever way you want to do it. And I have prepared things to work on. So here's our Google Classroom page. I personally like to go under classwork, because classwork is a lot easier to find things. I've started a topic for organic chemistry. Um, and there's several things that I've posted for you guys already. The first thing is the key resources. Um, so that is basically everything that I've handed out so far. Um, it should, where's the link gone? Did I not put the link there? I'll put the link on there. Um, it goes to my Google site. Anyway, I've also done a digital copy of the success criteria. So I want to give you guys flexibility. Some of you guys like to handwrite notes. Some of you guys like to type up your notes. And so I've made it possible for you to do both. So I've given you the booklet and hard copies of things. But if you want to do things online for your notes, you can. I have, first off, the success criteria. Everyone should hopefully have their own copy of it. Um, and you can just type in yes, no, X, mark, whatever. Um, so that's there for you on an online version. Um, the other thing that I've done for an online version is notes. So you have a Google Doc to write all your organic chemistry notes in. Um, it's useful for me to have it created as an assignment already for you guys so I can check it and look over it and I can potentially use it as any evidence. Because um, I'm always very mindful of the derived grade potential. So that's the other thing there. So I'm happy if you want to do your notes on paper or if you want to do your notes online. Um, 
The next thing here is our UE, so unexpected event grade evidence. Um, so I just created a Google Doc for you to kind of keep your work uh, if you want to show me anything uh, to keep track of it. Um, really useful in case we need to derive any grades and I'm looking for that evidence. Um, so you can type your answers in there. Um, you can take photographs of your work and put it in there. Um, you don't obviously need to do all of it, um, but if there's any kind of concern and you want to start collecting the evidence or I'm worried, I would say start putting some stuff in here. Um, also be mindful, any handed in work, because remember there's that box over there, um, I will mark and I will take a note of it. So that way um, I also have evidence as well. So feel free to either give me written work or online work to show me your evidence of understanding in case we need to derive any grade. Um, if you want me to check anything that's online, make a comment and tag me in it because then it sends me an email and I know to look at it. Okay? Um, so that's that, the main kind of overview stuff. And then the other thing I do is I post each lesson and I'll just number them in order. I've made a note of what week, day, and date we do these lessons on. So if you're uh, ever missing a lesson, you know which ones to go to. Um, I then link it to my Google site. Uh, because I like to be really, really organized, and the Google site is a way to do that. So um, with the Google site, I do record my lesson, so I'm recording it right now. Um, so if you do miss a lesson, you can see what we did. Um, I scan any notes that I write down, so that way you have a copy of that as well. Um, the PowerPoint that I'm using today is already online on that Google site. You just click the link. Um, it'll go to my Dropbox. And it should hopefully load it. There you go. And you can see exactly what we did in class. It's the same stuff that's in the booklet. So I have it both online and in paper. And what you can do actually then is, uh, if you want, copy and paste things over to your online notes as well. Um, I'm trying to teach you that student agency and get you to figure out your own style because you're going to need that for university. The last thing on here uh, is the Mahi choice. So I think I mentioned the other day I don't really assign homework um, because I want you guys have that flexibility. I want, I respect your time outside of school, but you should still be doing follow-up work to reinforce what we're doing in class. Um, so to help guide you in what to do, I have given you guys a Mahi choice and they're different levels. So that way it's differentiated and you can level up and go up as you feel fit. You are not expected to do all of it because it's obviously a lot of work, but it just gives you that chance of choice. Um, so I have some stuff listed here. Some of these things we have in the classroom as resources. Some of them um, we don't. And you can think about, okay, do I want to get education perfect? Do I want to get an, an ESA guide? Um, those are kind of things to think about. We will be giving you guys side pads though. Um, but I definitely do have things on there that aren't like education perfect ESA. There's stuff here that's also um, stuff that we have in class. And I'm happy if you guys want to check out any books like a library. Cool. And you can take these things home. So those are all the choices, and these are things that are examples that you could give me as evidence of understanding. So if you make some notes, then that shows me you are learning the material. Are we okay with that so far? I know that was like a lot of information in a short amount of time. Cool? Any questions? No? All right. So let's... Um, just kind of an introductory stuff with organic chemistry, looking at functional groups and looking at drawing the alkane. Um, this is just to get us started because I, it takes a while to learn organic chemistry. So that's what we're focusing on. The lesson plan today is kind of long, but a lot of these activities are really, really short. So we'll breeze through it quite quickly. Um, first off, I'll just introduce the topic and we'll do a little story time as part of our introduction, just a little fun. I have a consider the following question for you guys to have a little think. We have a podcast that's about six minutes long to listen to, which is, I think, really interesting on carbon chemistry. And in fact, they have a whole series on every single element, but carbon's the one we're worried about, or not worried, curious about. Um, then we'll actually dive into the organic chemistry. Um, you guys will have a chance just to kind of refresh how we group things in organic chemistry. We'll talk about functional groups. We'll play Quizlet. Uh, we'll start talking about alkanes. We'll do a fly swat game. We'll start talking about how we draw the alkanes, and then we'll finish up with some mahi choice. Cool? All right. So that's the agenda for today. Um, our success criteria. So this is what is on that red checklist and also what is online. So if you guys notice, 
that, like I said, I have um, a couple of columns. One is covered in class. The other one is I'm ready. Then there's revised for topic test, revised for mock, and revised for end of year exam. So that just gives you that option and opportunity to kick it off multiple times as you are studying and working. So the kind of class is the one that you tick off when I go through these slides, so that way you know what you might have missed in class. In this case, I don't think we're going to take it off quite yet because we're going to work on this over a couple of days um, because we need to revise all the different function groups, their properties, how to name them, how the reactions work, uh, those sort of things. But that's what we are looking at for today. By the end of today, you guys should be able to identify the function groups and you should be able to do the, the drawing of uh, alkanes. So if I give you an alkane name, you should be able to draw it. Are we good? Okay. So. Let's talk about our gift. I had the wrong code on there. Let me fix that. The code is nine one. There we go. And it's worth five credits. All right. Cool. So let's talk about organic chemistry. Um, this is a topic I really, really love. I think it's probably one of my favorites. Um, but I know it's not tends to be the student's favorite because it is quite difficult. Um, so, what the data comes from this one is an external. It is worth five credits. And I would say, in my opinion, this is the most important standard to prepare you for university. It's the most likely one you will probably be using. Um, and that's because we are carbon-based life forms. Uh, a lot of you guys mentioned you're interested in health science, medicine, dentistry, that sort of stuff. And so knowing this organic chemistry is going to be really important because it ties into the biochemistry aspect of material. Um, I was a pharmacologist, and so I needed to know a lot of organic chemistry because I needed to know chemical compounds and things like that. So this is going to be a really important foundation um, going forward into university. Are we good so far with that? All right. And I hopefully think that's in your booklet. So do have those booklets open. Don't be like mad that you're writing down. All this information because the information is like, yeah. Okay. So, let's do an introduction into the big picture of organic chemistry. Um, I'm going to give you guys a flow chart today. Um, and the reason why I want to give it to you now instead of at the end of when we finish is because I want us to kind of use it as we're learning. I would actually ask for this at the start of a, as a topic. And I was like, you know what, actually, it's a good idea for me to do that at the start. So you can see big picture what we're trying to do with organic chemistry. So with organic chemistry, it's, it's a challenging topic because you can't really answer a lot of answering questions. Until the very end of it, we need to know everything and how to learn. So that's going to be something that's going to be challenging about again. Um, the thing about organic chemistry is that everything interrelates to each other. Um, and that's why I think it's useful to see this low chart at the beginning, because you can see how one organic compound and its function group ties to another. The thing about organic chemistry is that it's not easy to rope learn because it's very much concepts and understanding how one thing relates to another and sequence of events. Um, that's why some people find it challenging. Um, but when we're looking at organic chemistry, we're studying organic compounds. We should always see carbon when we're looking at organic chemistry and hydrogen, and then sometimes oxygen, nitrogen, the other halogens. We also might see some metals as well. Uh, in this case, you won't at this level. But organic chemistry is really useful. It's a great building block. Uh, for a lot of our different compounds, such as fuel, solvents, plastic, beat soft, the whole kind of thing. So that's what we got to keep in mind with organic chemistry. Um, I love that joke, um, that question of where do you keep the chloroform? That was actually asked me when I was in the lab at like, I was doing my research and I was doing an experiment and it was like seven at night because I needed the machine. And then someone walked up to me and he was like, I hope this isn't creepy, but uh, do you have any chloroform I can borrow? Is needed for experiment. Very normal conversation in a lab. Not a normal conversation outside of the lab. Anyway, are we good with that so far? Do you guys know what chloroform is? Yeah. Yeah. Something that you like 
You put it on a towel and then you knock one out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, cool. cool. All right, so I want to start our organic chemistry with some story time. Would you guys like to go outside and kind of like do kindergarten, kind of like sit outside and open a book? Okay, we'll do that. Let's go outside and get some fresh air. You guys can take off your masks and I'll read you a story. All right. It's not over. <laughs> All right. So, I'm going to start with some stories by the three guys. Because um, I want you guys to start thinking about organic chemistry. So, organic chemistry, like I said, is known as carbon chemistry. And that's really important for all the life of the planet. So, I want you guys to quickly in your notes draw the electron arrangement for carbon. You can either write the electron configuration or draw a carbon atom. And I want you guys to think about why carbon is so important um, for our lives and for life. So, so maybe you guys are thinking about this, and you've kind of already got a hint about it in the book that we read. What group is carbon in in the periodic table? How many valence electrons does it have? And how do atoms gain stability? So I want you to be able to communicate across why is carbon so important it helps if you start by drawing the atom and then you kind of access that information so i'll give you just a few minutes to do that all right let's process this consider the following so looking at that consider the following question the first thing i wanted you guys to do is to draw the carbon atom and to think about the electron arrangement of that. So carbon, what's the electron arrangement? Two, four, and how do we know that? There's six electrons. Six electrons, and you can figure that out from the periodic table, which gives us the atomic number. So let's quickly draw that and have a little think about why carbon, why is carbon so special? Oh, give me more space. So carbon, we know, it's two, four, and when I think about my nucleus, there's six protons, there's six neutrons, I know that because the atomic mass is 12. And I have two electrons in that first shell, and four electrons in that second shell. And you can remember why I was so annoyed about that picture in that book. All right, all right, so when we're thinking about carbon, do you guys remember with ion creation what the goal was? We don't want to have a full atom shell, and we gain and lose electrons to be able to do that. In this example, though, what's unique about group 14 is they have four electrons in their outer shell. So with that four electrons, what's the easiest way to get a full shell? I either add four or subtract four. So you see how either way it's going to be the same, whereas every other ion that we've talked about, it's like clearly going to do one thing over the other. So that makes carbon really, really special because instead of it forming ions, it's going to form covalent bonds and share electrons and be a nice little building block to piece things together. So that is why carbon is such an important element and why this one is uniquely the one that we're using as a building block. If you're thinking about some of the other elements, we did about here at table. So let's say, for example, if I wanted to do nitrogen, like, why are we nitrogen-based life forms? So nitrogen has the atomic number of seven. So what makes that two and five? So even if, oh, let me write that down properly. What do we got? Seven and seven. I'm just going to make a bigger circle. So we know that nitrogen makes ions, right? Nitride, does that ring well? Gains three electrons. So, in theory, and if you guys remember in that organic chemistry book for babies, they were talking about how different um, balls can stick to a number of different other balls. Yeah? So, the maximum number we can 
have is four attachments. So nice and wouldn't be an ideal building block because it can only do three. So that is, you know, why carbon is such an important element. Uh, Blake made a really good point. What were you mentioning about one of the other elements? And I'm yes. Theoretically, yes. So if you look at up here in the table, carbon is the smallest atom in group 14. So that's what that's the, the carbon-based life forms. In theory, we should also be able to have silicon-based life forms because it has the same properties of having four valence electrons. Um, why do you think we aren't silicon-based? Not enough of it, yeah. So it's about availability. So as the atoms get bigger, they're obviously becoming less and less stable. Um, the other thing is, remember, every um, element was created in the Big Bang. And then the high pressure and heat and um, pushing them together. So you take two hydrogen atoms, you fuse them together, you make helium. Yeah? So quantity wise, we're going to have less silicon. So it's not an ideal building block if it's not in huge quantities. But in theory, we could have silicon based life. Does that make sense? All right. But it's not that's kind of neat to think about. So back to our note. So. And this is basically just a summary of what I just said, is just thinking about the fact that it can have those four valence electrons and do covalent bonds. And we can do lots of different types of bonds. They can be single, they can be double, they can be triple. That gives me so many variety and so much potential. Um, on top of that, it's not just carbon to carbon that's being bonded, it's carbon to other elements as well. Um, and we can create some really long chains, really complex structures, and make some really neat shapes. Um, we can also make rings as well. Now, in order to make a ring, we need at least three. We need to connect it together. I think that's mainly it for carbon. And my little joke about how it has been under a lot of pressure lately. Because when you pressurize the carbon, it makes diamond. All right. So I listen to a podcast. All right, so Arden Zen has put out this really good material. It's called Elemental. Uh, and what they've done is they've done an episode on each element of the periodic table. We will just listen to carbon because carbon is what we are concerned about for organic chemistry. But feel free to listen to the other ones because it is quite interesting. Cool. All right. Um, I've drew a couple of things on the board, but they're not crucial, obviously, for this topic. It was just as the podcast was going, I wanted to show you some of the things they were referring to. Uh, so they were talking about diamond and graphite and a different allotrop of carbon. It just has to do with how they're bonded. Um, you would have learned this in structure and bonding. Uh, that ball that's being passed around is that what Buckman's ball or whatever referring to. Um, so you can see what that looks like. Um, and they were talking also about carbon-14. Uh, that's an isotope. I don't know if you guys have learned about isotopes, but it's just same element because the thing that sets the element is the number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So there's a amount of carbon-14, and then it will lose the electrons, or sorry, not lose the electrons, lose the neutrons with time and go from carbon-14 to 12. Uh, that happens at a set amount of time, so you can use the percentage of carbon-14 to figure out then the date of it. So that's what you hear for carbon dating. Um, I think that was mainly kind of the only things that I wanted to kind of clarify uh, just in case, because I know... Um, Oh, sorry if anybody wanted that. <laughs> uh, but it's not important for the standard, it's just extra information. Um, cool. My area of expertise when it comes to carb or when it comes to chemistry is that analytical chemistry. Uh, I did a lot of work for my master's just figuring out um, concentrations of stuff. All right. So our next activity then is just some grouping ideas. So the cards that you guys cut out for today's do next, we will be using them. Uh, I've given you 24 different organic molecules, and I want you to look for patterns in those parts. Um, I want you to think about how can we group those parts into different kind of categories. So, if you want to look at pairs or groups, I want you to kind of look at all of them and look for patterns. Science is all about finding patterns. All right.
So we can group organic molecules in two different ways when we're thinking about it. The first way is the number of carbons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so you should notice when you're looking on there that I think I only gave four the maximum number of carbons. Um, we can also group it by culture, which is what most of you guys did as your first initial grouping. So that's really important because that's going to explain then how we do the naming of our different organic compounds. Um, both of these factors will affect the properties that the organic molecule has, um, and that's what we're going to be looking at as well. Cool. Question? All right, you guys can put the, shuffle up the cards, put them back in the little plastic bag so that way the next class doesn't have them in an order. That's why I was like, I'm going to start from the very beginning because I'm like, I don't know how much you picked up during lockdown. It's okay, we're going to start from the very beginning. All right, can I keep going? to it as organic compounds. Remember, this is organic. It's different from when you think about like organic at the supermarket. Okay? Um, makes lots of different things. Um, you obviously have the carbon. You should have hydrogen. You'll probably have oxygen in all of these molecules as well. Uh, but you can also have other elements like nitrogen. Um, just note, if you just have a compound that is only carbon, uh, that is inorganic. 90% of all of our known substances are organic, so that's why it's really important that we understand organic chemistry. Uh, that's why you're likely to come across it at some point in the science kind of background and context. Um, and there's lots of many potential structures that can happen, so that's why it is the building block and it makes up so many other drugs and other uh, stuff. Uh, with this giant flow chart, these are names of different types of functional groups, and you can see they go from one to another. Um, and that's because of all the different reactions they occur. Not all of them go direct directly to each other, so you might need to go through as a sequence of events to go from one section to the other section. And they have a really large influence on the compound and their properties, it'll affect their reactivity. Um, to bring in by the function group because they're going to have those same properties. And so with a lot of the teaching that I do, I will be teaching it based off of function group, um, and then we'll start bridging it all together. Cool. All right. The function groups in organic chemistry, it looks like a lot, but we're not going to learn all of them. Um, we do alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, alcohols, uh, haloalkane, we do. Uh, aldehyde and ketone are going to be new for this year, um, and we'll do those. Carboxylic acid, uh, we'll do esters and amides uh, and acid chlorides. So these ones are all going to be new for this year. Uh, we'll do amine, and I think that's it from that bottom row. But there's obviously a lot of other things in there, and that's why it continues at university. Cool. The other thing to keep in mind is the word homologous, uh, and it's just talking about a repeated structure. You see that again a lot in organic chemistry. Um, what we will often see is like CH3, and then you'll see parentheses CH2, and then they'll have like a number with that CH3 here. So it could be, uh, sorry, CH2. So it could be two, it could be four. They're just saying that we're repeating that uh, intersection multiple times. The mass then of how that molecules differ is 14. And the reason why it's 14 is because carbon has a mass of 12. The hydrogen has a mass of one. And since we have two of them, the total is 14. Not so important for this topic, but when we move on to spec, that's gonna be a really useful number to know. 14. 
to see how well you remember your function. Oh, <laughs> Where's that life? Hey, Mike, what's your life for? All right. Cool. Right. So, uh, let's talk about the types of formula that we're going to see in organic chemistry so you guys are aware when things pop up. Uh, the most common one you'll probably see with a lot of our work is this condensed formula, which lists out all the carbons and also how it's bonded together. So in this case, I'm looking at a um, carboxylic acid because I can see that it has the OOH, so a double bond oxygen and an OH. That's usually how we see a lot of things, but we also might see that formula being displayed. Um, or sorry, I say, yeah, that formula being displayed like this, and that's showing how it looks with all the bondage expanded out. Um, you might see it structurally where you have the lines just to kind of indicate where each carbon is. Um, you might see it skeletal. You see that quite frequently because it's a nice um, condensed way of writing it. The thing to remember with the skeletal form is that every kind of corner is a carbon and the end is a carbon, unless you see it has an oxygen on the end. So it's just useful to kind of see the different ways that we communicate across um, our formula. The other two that's really important to note for organic chemistry is the empirical formula and the molecular formula. So with the empirical formula, it just gives me a list of all the elements in that organic molecule. So I have taken this and instead of writing uh, one, two, three, four, or check out, I'm on, sorry, molecular formula. Instead of writing one, two, three, four carbons out like that, I've just done C4, and then I've counted up all the hydrogens, and then I've counted up the two oxygens. So we see molecular formula a lot, and the thing with the molecular formula is that we have a lot of molecules that share that molecular formula. The other thing to keep in mind is we have something called an empirical formula, which is a simplified version of the molecular. It's basically just a um, like a fraction component of it. So I could simplify this molecular formula and have it all divided by two, and that's my empirical formula. It's important to know the difference because when you read the question and when they present the question to you, they might present you the empirical formula but the molecule that you're actually working with is a multiple of that. We'll see it a bit in um, spec in our next topic, but I think mostly for organic chemistry, they present things to you in molecular formula, condensed formula, or one of these kind of display model ones. Okay. So that's the first thing to kind of note. We just mind that we only have five minutes left, and we can also finish the notes in our next lesson. So that's not an issue. Um, cool. So. The first function group we often talk about isn't really a function group, function group. Uh, it's the alkane. And that was the way that I wanted you guys to kind of group them, is thinking about number. So, this is a homologous series, again, because we're looking at repeated structure. And this um, series only has molecules that are made up of carbon and hydrogen. So, we look at all these that are provided here, just carbon and hydrogen. This is the general formula for it. It's just saying the ratio of carbon to hydrogen. Not in this topic, but useful when we do spec. Spec parallels really well with organic chemistry. But all it's saying here is that the number of hydrogen is two times the number of carbon plus two. So if I look at all these organic molecules and I exclude the carbon or the hydrogens at the end, I notice that's what the ratio is. One, two, three carbons six hydrogens and then plus two for the hydrogens on the end. So that's what that ratio is referring to. Again, useful to know that because some of the questions will help you kind of figure out what you're dealing with. These guys contain no functional group. There's no double bonds, there's nothing special, there's no nitrogen, no oxygen, that sort of stuff. We also refer to these molecules as being saturated. And the reason why they're saturated is because I've maximized the number of bonds my carbon can have. 
All right. Um, these guys, having wise, the longer my chain becomes, the higher the melting and the higher the boiling point. And if you think back to structure and bonding from last year, it has to do with how many intermolecular bonds you can make. Um, just because then you're going to have to have more energy to bring all of the intermolecular forces. So that's why we see that sort of pattern going on. Just watching the time. People can finish this one. That's probably where we're going to stop today. So here's the chain. Some things to remember. The physical state is really dependent on the length of that carbon chain. The longer it comes, then it's more likely to need more energy to break up those bonds. So we tend to have a gas up to five. Five to 17 is when you have a liquid, and anything 17 plus, now we're dealing with a solid. These guys have a really strong odor. Um, they have really low melting point and boiling point. Uh, these guys are insoluble in water. So you guys remember, again, back to structure and bonding, we talked about polarity of the molecule and how water is a polar molecule. In this case, the alkanes are non-polar, so they're not going to mix. Very low density. Uh, do not conduct electricity and do not really conduct heat that well. Um, really good solvent for non-polar substances. So I used that a lot when I was with the naming and the drawing uh, next lesson. Right? Um, so you guys know what to do. If you want to check out any of the books, let me know. I can write it down um, because they're all textbooks are over there and then like workbooks are over on that side. Um, there is some links to a worksheet if you guys want to do a worksheet, and there's some answers as well. So, just to summarize today, you guys should be able to do the different functional groups. Uh, we haven't had a chance to do this first part, our next lesson. Um, you should be able to do this first part here and identify the various functions. All right, and then we'll do naming in our next lesson. If you feel like you have another bit of sense right here, you can take it off, but I think it's probably not yet because we still got to build some more on that. All right, cool. That's us for today.